Back when I took my first economics course in college, microeconomics and macroeconomics together constituted a full year's course, and half of that, or a full semester, was devoted to macroeconomics. You're going to get four days of macroeconomics. Sorry about that. I could have taught you microeconomics with a textbook I used my freshman year of college more than 40 years ago. The examples would be incredibly outdated. The analysis, though, would really be pretty much the same. That is not true for macroeconomics. Theories about what drives economic growth, what causes unemployment, recession, and inflation have changed a lot in the past 40 years. And frankly, economists have reached a lot less consensus about these issues than they have about the behavior of consumers, producers, and markets. Microeconomics has been around since Adam Smith published The Wealth of Nations in 1776, if not earlier. Macroeconomics, on the other hand, was really born in the Great Depression. The depth of that economic catastrophe led economists to look much more closely at what is called the business cycle. You see a picture of that here. And to look much more closely, desperately, for some way to bring it under some kind of control. No serious economist thinks business cycles can be eliminated altogether. Economies overheat, wages rise, raw materials get scarcer and more expensive, investors bid up the price of assets, including housing and stocks, until the bubble bursts, the overheated economy boils over, there are all sorts of metaphors people use, but basically businesses lay off workers and the economy enters a recession. The economy then recovers, see the upturn on the chart, and the whole process begins again. The y-axis on the business cycle chart you just saw says economy, but what this really means is GDP. You remember GDP, right? It's basically the total goods and services produced by an economy. The amount of stuff times the price of the stuff adjusted for inflation so that increases represent real expansion of output and not just higher prices. So your real wages, for example, are how much your income or your salary has gone up adjusted for inflation. Your nominal income would be simply what you get on your paycheck and not reflecting those changes. A recession occurs when real GDP declines for two or more consecutive quarters. That's the definition used by the National Bureau of Economic Research, the folks who get to make the formal declaration that a recession has occurred, usually when it's already over. So here's a graphical snapshot of the business cycle from 1960 to 2010. The gray bands in this graph represent recessions since 1960. The average growth rate for the economy has been around 3%, but you'll note that we fell below that average after 2000 and that the recession of 2008 was one of the steepest since 1960. Note, by the way, that this is GDP per capita, that is GDP divided by population. The bar graph carries up, this bar graph carries us up to the present. And in fact, it's hot off the presses. The first quarter GDP increase for 2015 was just announced this morning. That is the morning of Wednesday, April 29th. That's the day I'm recording this lecture. So did the first quarter of 2014 represent a recession? No, not technically. It saw a pretty steep drop in GDP, but it only lasted for a quarter. Since then, there have been many signs that the economy is picking up, not least rising wages. The quarter that ended at the beginning of April was not a recession either, but it represented disappointingly low economic growth. You'll read more about this when you take the quiz. So now we move back in time to the Great Depression and the birth of macroeconomics. This graph should give you a sense of why the Great Depression spurred a whole new branch of economics. GDP dropped almost 27% between 1929 and 1933, and then it dropped again in 1937. In mid-1938, total GDP was not much larger than GDP in 1929. Economic historians are still pretty heatedly debating the reasons why not so much the Great Depression initially happened, but why it went so deep and why it lasted so long. And there are some points of agreement, however. Yes, the stock market crash of October 1929 pretty clearly set the whole mess off, but this begs the question of why stocks crashed. And just how far did stock prices fall in 1929? I used to ask my economics class that question every year. Usually students guessed that stocks had lost almost all of their value in just a couple of days. 
Well, this graph tells a somewhat different story. In fact, stocks dropped significantly. They dropped 36% from their high point in October 1929 to the beginning of 1930. But if you look at the measurement from January 1929 to January 1930, in other words, discounting a, an uptick, a bubble in the middle of 1929, um, the loss was only 21%. That's a big loss, but it was also about the same loss that the U.S. stock markets experienced in the most recent 2008-2009 recession. In other words, the crash of 1929 certainly sparked a serious downturn. But what really distinguished the Great Depression was that the economy continued its downward spiral until 1934 and didn't really recover until the 1940s. The most catastrophic effect of the Great Depression was mass unemployment, 25% at the peak depression year of 1933. So why did a downturn become a tailspin? Probably the most common explanation among economists, although as I said, there's debate, is that there was a catastrophic drop in the money supply, or the stock of money. Many people had borrowed to buy stocks on margin. When stock prices fell, they had to withdraw money from their uh, bank deposits, from their checking accounts or savings accounts. So much money was withdrawn that many of these banks failed, and this rippled through the economy due to the money multiplier effect, which I'll talk about very briefly in a later lecture. The Federal Reserve failed to act decisively to protect banks and increase the money in circulation. One of the greatest living experts on the Fed's errors in the 1930s is a fellow who used to be an economics professor at Princeton University and is now the chairman of the Federal Reserve, Ben Bernanke. In this most recent recession, the Federal Reserve acted very aggressively to expand the money supply, and we didn't go into a depression. On the other hand, we have not had a very strong recovery. The jury is still out on whether the Federal Reserve chose the right policy, whether it should have gone to the extremes that it did. We really probably won't know for a number of years. And again, I'm going to talk more about money later. Many economists also think that government intervention by both Republican President Herbert Hoover and Democratic President Franklin Roosevelt made the Depression worse. And by the way, I'm not talking about social welfare programs like the Works Progress Administration or Social Security. I'm talking about efforts by both President Hoover and President Roosevelt to keep prices and wages from falling. They even allowed businesses to form legally sanctioned cartels to try to keep prices up. Uh, many economists now think that it would have been smarter to let wages and prices drop to a, to a new equilibrium, that this would have been painful, but that the economy would have adjusted back more quickly. I'm not really casting blame on either president here. People did not understand how the money supply worked back back then, and both presidents were simply trying their best to meet a desperate crisis. In my next two lectures, I'm going to talk more about how in our post-depression macroeconomics world, government intervenes to meet economic crises through fiscal policy, that is government spending and taxes, and through monetary policy or adjustments to the money supply. For now, I'm going to close my business cycle lecture by briefly discussing unemployment and even more briefly inflation. What's important to understand about unemployment is that it is not simply a measure of how many people aren't working. Specifically, technically, it is a measure of the number of people in the labor force who want to work but cannot find work. So what is the labor force? Well, this is a complicated chart, but what it shows is that there are a lot of people who are not in the labor force. Active duty military, full-time students, people who are in prison uh, or other institutions, stay-at-home parents, the disabled, the retired, and a very important group people who are available to work but are no longer or have never been actively searching for work. So the percent of the entire population that is working is also known as the labor force participation rate. One reason why the unemployment rate has been going down in the past few years is actually a little scary. Labor force participation has been trending down. A surprisingly large number of people have simply dropped out of the labor force. How many of them will return as the economy picks up is one of the major questions economists are asking right now. Labor force participation climbed steadily in the 1980s, partly because more women were entering the workforce. It leveled off toward the end of the 1990s and has dropped pretty steeply for the last six years. You'll read more about this when you take your quiz. 
The best explanation I've ever seen of how unemployment is calculated is actually comes from Stephen Colbert. I showed uh, this clip to my JD class when it aired back in 2008 during the most recent economic meltdown. And I was very pleased to find it is still up on the web. I really hope you get this far in the podcast and stop to listen to the word. It's also posted on Moodle. Unemployment is also complicated because there are different kinds of unemployment. And attacking these different kinds of unemployment arguably requires different kinds of strategies. Usually, the government's official unemployment figures will include the phrase seasonally adjusted. This means that the statisticians have adjusted for changes that always occur seasonally, like lifeguards losing their jobs on Labor Day or Santa's elves finding themselves out of work on December 26th. The reason unemployment will never be zero is that a certain number of people are always temporarily and necessarily between jobs because they're transferring with a spouse, or looking for a job that relates to their college major, etc. Of course, it usually takes longer for frictionally unemployed to find work during a recession. There's actually a lot of debate about how much unemployment fits into this structural unemployment category. In other words, how much reflects a mismatch between skills employers need and skills workers actually have. Some jobs simply become obsolete. So, for example, during the early Industrial Revolution, uh, there was a rise of textile factories. This put out of work a large number of highly accomplished hand weavers. Their skills were simply no longer needed in the labor market. But usually when we're talking about unemployment, we are asking, we are talking about people who lose their job because the economy has entered a recession. So here's a picture of unemployment in the last decade. You can see there was a huge jump in unemployment in 2008 and 2009, and it has only been very gradually falling. So this policy goal is actually U.S. law. Congress explicitly charged the federal government with accomplishing full employment with price stability, if they could figure out how. It's a little ironic that 1978 was the year this was passed. It was a year in which unemployment and inflation were both high. Why might a 4% unemployment rate actually reflect a dangerously tight labor market? Well, usually when unemployment gets this low, employers are having a hard time filling many positions, especially for highly skilled workers or workers with rarer skills. Wages rise, the economy overheats, to use more of the metaphors that financial journalists love, and this threatens still another turn in the boom-bust cycle. Similarly, most economists think that a little bit of inflation uh, is good for is necessary for a growing economy. Right now, a lot of people are worried that we may be experiencing deflation. I'll talk more about how the government tries to reduce unemployment in my next lecture, but let me just briefly discuss the other important policy goal, which is maintaining low rates of inflation. Inflation refers to a rise in the overall price level, not in individual prices. Deflation refers to a fall in overall prices. Inflation has not been a major problem in recent years, but it was a huge concern back when I was studying economics and hunting for my first job out of graduate school and buying my first house. Uh, that was around 1972 to 1982. So I've circled those years, and you can see there was major inflation then, and there was major inflation during the Roaring Twenties, another uh, economic uh, cause, probably the stock market price of the of the bubble that was uh, created in assets. And it also happened during and immediately after World War II when there had been a lot of pent-up demand and where prices had been held down by wage and price controls during the war. So the CPI is what is sometimes called a market basket of selected goods and services that the government uses to measure inflation. So what does and what should go into this market basket measurement is actually the source of a lot of debate. In particular, economists debate how heavily highly volatile prices, such as uh, oil prices or in sometimes housing prices, how much, the, how much weight they should have in this measurement of inflation. Well, I'm going to stop here and resume with the discussion of government spending, tax, and monetary policies in my next two lectures. You have a quiz. Some of it should be based, will be based on what I've talked about in this lecture. Hope you took notes. Some is based on readings on these topics. Uh, I'm going to, as I said, 
give you lectures on government spending and tax policy, fiscal policy, and on monetary policy. Again, ridiculously truncated and brief. In my very last lecture, I'm going to talk about debt. My goal is to make you very, very mad and mad at me, or at least at my generation.